Welcome to Rampage, No Change. Now, I tried to film this twice because I kind of got pissed off about certain things that happened on Wednesday when it came to Diana Perrazzo and to the Mercedes Martinez. I've heard people say, why did Diana Perrazzo have the job? For me, it's not like that. It was that Diana should have jobbed at a pay-per-view to make the title and the unification for Mercedes important. As far as anyone is concerned, many people still think all H is an entity. All H is no entity. It's nothing except an extension of AEW. And if Tony wanted to make it important, he should have set up the women's title going to double or nothing. It doesn't have to close the show. It just had to be on the damn show to make it mean something. But he didn't want to do it. So that ticked off a lot of people. For me personally, it ticked me off because they won't throw it on a pay-per-view. I'm sorry. Putting it on Dynamite was dumb. Particularly only giving it 8 minutes out of maybe 12 or 13 minutes. With about 4 minutes out of that 12 minutes dedicated to commercials and maybe two minutes, maybe three, dedicated to setting up for the damn match. That was dumb. Now we look at Rampage. There are things there that have not changed, which I do believe they need to change, and things that have not changed, which is fine, leading into Double or Nothing. Now, Storm and Soho versus Hater and Baker. Now, I know people want to see a little bit more of a Tony Storm and her OnlyFan. I know many of you want to see her feet or your or her butt. That let's be honest, that's what many of you want. But I still see her as a woman who got so pissed at a company before she walked away. Luckily, didn't have to be sued about it. They just let her go. And let me give it to you like this: seeing her get the pin on Britt Baker. It's fine if it leads somewhere. It must lead somewhere. Now, of course, we're going to see Hater versus Storm in the round. They, they finished the qualifying. Now they're going to have their round. So Hater and Storm will have their moment. So the question is going to be, once Tony Storm gets past Hater, because there's no way Jamie Hater is going to win. If she does win, what was the point of her? And this is Tony Storm dealing with a Britt Baker. It can't go down that route. I'm just saying. Now, Hook versus DJ Drake, if I'm remembering his name correctly. A guy who's 20 years in the business. When you look at that match, it didn't look... I'm not saying that he didn't need the job to Hook. He did. But I do believe he could have had better, better defense. Because let's make this honest. Yes, it's Taz's son. We know that Taz taught him judo because Taz in real life knows judo. So you can see he knows actually how to do judo throws. He knows how to do Japanese wrestling, but also Japanese martial arts. It's obvious. But it shouldn't have been that easy. I'm sorry, under this situation, it should have been a bit more of a difficulty getting it done. Now, mind you, headbutting a chop, a knife onto the chest. Knife Edge Chop was actually a nice touch, but seeing that he could not struggle enough, he needed to struggle a little bit more. Look, I like Hook. I do him like everybody else. I like him, but he needs to struggle. He's got to begin to struggle now. Yes, he can still win, but he needs to struggle. If he's too dominant, it's going to go the wrong way. I'm just saying. Now, Dan Hauser came out asking for help because... Later in the night, Tony Nietzsche, no, earlier, Tony Nietzsche wants a match with Dan Hauser in the Long Island, New York. Not far from me. Actually, it's like a couple hours ride. I have to go on the LIRR to get there. But still, he's going to face Dan Hauser. And he's asking Hook, please be by my side. And he tried to offer Hook a little bit of a token, a little bit of chips, because Hook likes chips. But he shoves him down, picks up the chips, and he's going like, really? Well, actually, it's Hook's birthday, actually. And he doesn't throw it across over his shoulder. I'm just saying, he looks at it, he's going, really? Drops it to the floor and walks. 
this is going to become uh, hook housing, the hook and house connection. Maybe the hook and house connection will probably be better than the hook housing. That really, <laughs> I'm just saying you actually, if you look at the match, this is something I kind of wish Impact Wrestling had done. Not the match itself for a Marsha Slamovich, but the booking of Hook, seeing him in the back, not talking, showing that he's dominant is what, guess what, Marsha should be looking like. And the only reason I'm bringing Impact is because Marsha Slamovich should be like this. That she should be dominant in the ring, but then be seen in the back, not talking much, is very unapproachable, but you still see she's unapproachable, and it means something when someone approaches her to have a match, because just seeing her come out is not enough, because that's exactly what they did with Goldberg. Now, the... Hmm... How can I say this? Ooh. How can I say this when it came to Eddie Kingston calling up Chris Jericho, saying simply, Chris, I'm coming for you. When my wife knows how to deal with me, even though I have been crazy all my life, she's always been able to handle it. She can handle me when I'm broken. She can handle me doing everything and had been handling everything. But when she saw me come home this time around, she started crying. I, and he started laughing. I, <laughs> I can't stand it. I'm going to make you hurt. You do not get away with this. Particularly, you just made my wife cry. I'm going to make you pay for making my wife cry. This was a good segment for Eddie Kingston. Something you don't see every day. That someone uses a smartphone to call someone on commentary. When do you see WWE do it? They don't. When you see Impact do it. They haven't done it in a long time of ever. It's not something that's normally done. And it's a nice change. I kind of wish Impact had done it. I kind of wish NWA would do it. I haven't seen Power or USA last week. So I want to see if I can look at Power USA this weekend. And Oh, no, damn it. Under Siege is going to be tonight, this tomorrow night. So maybe I'll probably do Power and USA on Sunday. Because I couldn't do it this Sunday. I wasn't able to do it. So maybe I will try and do it this Sunday. But I kind of wish... That they would do it. Somebody would. I'm just saying. Now. Um, Yuka Sakazawi. Or Sakazaki. Versus Rio. This is where we got a problem. Where things don't change. For Hook. It should have changed a little bit. Hook should have struggled a little bit. But it doesn't mean he couldn't still be dominant. Here. This never changes when it comes to Pacific women from Japanese wrestling that are being used. Yuka Sakazawi or Sakazaki should have gone forward. I know Rio just came back from shoulder surgery, but I'm being honest here. Rio, we've seen enough of. Sheeta is still dealing what was dealing with deeps, and now she's not dealing with deeps. So let Sheeta not be near deeps. Let Rio not be anywhere and let any of the other Japanese wrestlers come up. Yuka Sakazaki could have been brought up and done dumb video packages with and done something where she was allowed to talk and be given the ability to speak and be understood through subtitles, even if she can't speak English. It doesn't matter. You need to show other damn women other than the ones you want from Japanese wrestling. This is bullshit. She should have won. She should have won. It's not the point that I like Yuka. It's not. Yeah, if I look at Yuka compared to Rio, who would I rather be with? They're both in their 20s. I am, yes, an old man. Doesn't mean I couldn't date either one of them. Who would I rather be with? They're both beautiful. Probably go with Yuka because she looks a little more interesting. But the point, no matter if she's interesting or not, when are we going to see more women from the women's Japanese wrestlings be promoted and built up? We don't. The only time we even seen a Yuka was almost a year and a half ago on Rampage, no, on Dynamite. And it was something that was dealing with, what, 
Avalon at one point a little bit next to Rio. I could be wrong about Rio. I, no, I'm wrong about Rio. It is Sheeta. But even if it was here, Kushida, and I know that Yuka came back at one point, did a little bit, and then disappeared because around the same time that was Abaddon, Abaddon showing up, even if she had to just go back to Japan, still, you need a change of women. Switch the... Calm down. The way it works, you get women up here, or men, bring them all the way up to the top, and then you bring them, cycle them down, and bring them up, and cycle them down, and bring them up to rebuild them and cycle them down. You don't do like this because you end up like WWE having the same damn people in the same areas doing nothing. Yuka loses. I'm not surprised. Let's move on. Now, I didn't see anything with the baddies. I think they did mention them, but they didn't say any, didn't do anything with the baddies. Now, Jungle Boy did attack a Starks. So, we will have their match next week. To me, you want to know who I want to win? Jungle Boy. I want Jungle Boy to win and hold that title until the end of the year. You know why? Let Hook go after his dad's title. That is how you really start getting Hook. If you don't think Hook is ready, and this is the creative team and Tony, if you don't think he's ready for the, the world title picture, you don't think he's ready for the TNT title picture, make him go after the FTW title and hold it for a while before trying to transition to TNT. This is what I'm saying. Let him hold his dad's title for a while, let him drop it, and then move up. Next year, he can be ready for the TB, TNT title. But he's got to start somewhere. Let him go after his dad's title, not the tag team titles, just his dad's title. It's a legacy thing. It'll be a right way to book him. If you want him to forget about his dad's title, what the fuck are you thinking? What are you thinking? You cannot let Taz's title not go around the waist of his own damn son. That would be stupid. I'm just saying. And finally, if I'm forgetting some, I'm sorry. Jay Lethal versus um, Ticket. I can't even pronounce the guy's name. I have only seen him once. He looks interesting. Now, he speaks English, which is great. Does he speak very good English? No, but he doesn't have to speak great English. He just got to speak English and have charisma. And when I saw him in the ring, what is his name? Tecote? Tecote. I think Tecote. Tecote. I'm mispronouncing. I'm sorry. But his attitude when he was facing a Jay Lethal, he was mocking him, doing a little bit of the, the strutting of a, of a Ric Flair. Woo! That is charisma. That is attitude. Look, guys, I know people love spots, high spots, low spots, grapple wrestling. Yes, it's important that you can go in the ring. But the person who's working in the ring has to sometimes have a certain amount of personality. Yes, they could be known as a total submission specialist, like a Kurt Angle. But Kurt also developed a character. So when he couldn't wrestle, he had to fall back on that character just like a Stone Cold Steve Austin. Just like what happened with Triple H. He got hurt. He went away. He came back. He worked on his character, made himself more over with his character as much as his ring work. Everyone has to have some level of something to go with the wrestling. Yes, there are wrestlers that can get over just with their wrestling. But sometimes to make them go from good wrestlers to good pro wrestlers is not just their damn ring ability. It's actually more. And this guy has a personality. Yes, he mocked a Jay Lethal. That could mean he could be a little bit more. That means maybe he could be someone that likes to mock people in AEW TV. And he's from DDT Wrestling. I don't remember what it means, but I think I have once seen DDT at one time, at least once, but it was in Japanese, so I couldn't understand what being said. But it's good to see another person from another promotion. I'd like to see someone from Pro Wrestling Noah next showing up in AEW TV. I didn't expect him to win, and he did. And he started getting thumped on by a Jay Lethal, a, what is it, Shima Singh. Why did they all sing? 
and the Sanjay Duff. And then Best Friends came out, attacking Jay Lethal and Sanjay Duff. Then you got Orange Cassidy bothering and sing. And then you got Samoa Joe trying to come out and then was being held back by security, all going like this. Really? Ah. Uh, was this groundbreaking? But no change. Nothing groundbreaking. No change. No change in the status quo where some of these things should be changed and others should stay the same. It's fine. Certain things need to stay the same going into Double or Nothing. But other things like Yuka winning that instead of Rio would have been a nice change of pace. Seeing that Hook had to struggle against J, no, JD Drake a little bit. He should have struggled more because he has 20 years experience and being over 300 pounds, he should have struggled a bit more. It was a little too easy still. He should now have problems beginning to get more and more people who are more credible, more difficult, and it should be a little more time where it has to be harder for him to really get the job done. Instead of like six or five minutes, it should be almost a 10 to 15 minute match eventually building up to it. But it's just me. Peace. And oh, I'm doing a Gump Report after this, and it will be about Ember Moon and her interview with Chris Van Bleen. Peace.